Hi, welcome to this video on global variables part four. This is the last part that we'll be discussing global variables as part of the Moodle formulas question type. So as you found, global variables are super complicated. They can do a lot of really cool things. And this video is gonna be no different. We're gonna learn some added functionality of the global variables. And so first up is the pick function. And what the pick function allows you to do is have say a comma separated list of items and then randomly or strategically pick one of those items from the list. Now you should be thinking that sounds a lot like the way you'd use an array. And it actually is. There's hugely similar functionality between the pick function and the array function. One of the key differences between the pick function and the array function, however, is the pick function will allow you to select or pick an item that extends beyond the cardinality of the list. So what do I mean? Well, let's suppose your list has say three items in it. If you're building an array with those three items and you ask Moodle to pull the seventh item from that array, Moodle's going to produce an error because there isn't seven items in the array. What will happen unfortunately is if this is going on during a quiz, some students might be given an index that makes sense and it'll actually produce numbers for students. While other students are given an index that extends beyond the length of the array and are given a random error message and can even crash their Moodle quiz. So you have to be really cognizant and careful when you're building arrays to make sure that you're not selecting an index that extends beyond the number of items in the comma separated list. The pick function, however, you don't have to be as careful. You can say have a three item list, comma separated, and then say let's pick the seventh item from that three item list. What will happen? Well, it's actually quite random. Your guess is as good as mine, quite frankly. It's not going to error out, it is going to work, it just might not produce as predictable results as what we might want. So that's one of the differences between the pick function and how one would actually utilize an array. Okay, so next thing on our list is called the ternary operator. And with all programming languages, it's often convenient to use conditional logic when building algorithms. Well, what do we mean by conditional logic? Well, like in Microsoft Excel, when you have if statements, if this, then this. Well, if four is greater than three, then show X or produce X. Otherwise, produce Y. This conditional logic is something that's really common in many programming languages and is something that you can utilize within the Moodle formulas question type. It just looks a little bit different and to some it looks much more complicated. So what happens? Well, it utilizes something called the ternary operator, which is the question mark symbol. And so what happens with the ternary operator? Well, it reads exactly like conditional logic would usually read. And that is, if four is greater than three, so we're saying four is greater than three, then produce X, otherwise produce Y. And so you can see based upon this color coding exactly how the ternary operator works. You have this conditional statement of four greater than three, then your operator, and then your true, so your value if true, so if four is greater than three, x is what we're producing, otherwise y is what we're producing. And that's how conditional logic works within the Moodle formulas question type. So now let's dive into a demo on how to utilize these new functionalities in our global variables. Okay, so we'll create a new question. We'll go formulas. Let's name our question. So our name for our question is going to be delete dash pick and ternary. And let's declare our variables. So our first variable that we're going to declare is the random variable. And this random variable essentially is going to pick a distance. So let's suppose we have a question we're going to ask, Jim walks a certain distance at a certain angle. And we want to determine is east-west movement out of that distance and angle. So we're going to have a random distance and a bunch of random angles. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to have angles that are straight up at 90 degrees or north. And I don't want to have straight east or west. So I'm going to strategically build a couple different choices for my angles. Here we go. My distance is given by some random number. The first angle possibility is some angle in quadrant one. My second angle possibility is some angle in quadrant two. 
third angle possibility and fourth angle possibility. So there's our possibilities for our angles. Notice we're strategically not allowing it to be 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees, etc. So now what I got to do is I have to select one of these given angles to actually show to students in the question. So on the next line down, I'm going to create another random variable that selects one of these random given angles. So I'm going to use a selector, and the selector is going to be 0, 1, 2, or 3. So what I would like is this to be my zeroth item, this to be my first, second, and then this to be my third possible angle. And I'm going to build a global variable that's going to randomly select one of those angles to display to students. Okay, so here we are in our global variables, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to say angle is given by pick of the selector from either angle 1, angle 2, angle 3, or angle 4. And we're now utilizing our pick function as part of our global variable. Now, if you're looking at this thinking, I could have done that with an array, you absolutely could have done that with an array, without question. You could have said angle is given by the array of angle 1, or angle 2, or angle 3, or angle 4, and you could have said as my index, I'm going to use my selector. No question. We did that sort of in a prior video. We absolutely could have done that here. What we're saying, however, is the difference between the pick function and the array function is if by chance your selector here extended all the way up to, say, 20, there's a chance that maybe this then is going to be something like 15. And what Moodle's going to do is say, well, you can't take the 15th index item because there isn't 15 items in the array. So Moodle's going to produce an error to students and potentially even crash their Moodle quiz. So we have to be really careful to match up how many items are in our array with what the possibility is for our index. We don't have to be as cognizant with using that when we're working with the pick function. However, the pick function is going to not be very predictable if we're not matching things up effectively. So I want to turn this back down to three. And in this video, of course, ah, we're not doing arrays. Let's use our pick function. There we go. Now, for our second global variable, what I'm going to essentially do is try to determine what the east-west direction of the student is. I know the student walks a certain distance at an angle that I've just selected. So I can find out their east-west direction or their x component, of course, using the cosine function. So x component is given by distance times cosine of the angle. Now, one thing to take note of here is all my angles were, of course, in degrees. And Moodle can't use trig functions with degree angles. So I do have to use this convenient degree to rad function to convert my angle to radians and thereafter use the cosine function. So that's going to produce my x component. And essentially, it's going to be my answer to the question as to how far the student travels in the east or west direction. One of the problems with this, of course, however, is it's probably going to produce a really long decimal number. And I want now to tell students round to this or et cetera. So I'm going to create yet another global variable. And this global variable is going to ask students, basically, to round to four significant digits. And so there we go. <clears throat> now we have the makings of a really nice question. Let's start to put our question text together. So in our question text, here we go. Jim walked some distance in meters at an angle of angle degrees. What was the distance that Jim walked in the east or west direction? There we go. There's part one to hold our place for those answer boxes or the answer box. Now, what I'm going to do is go down to the bottom and specify my answer in the parts. So in parts, I want my first answer here, of course, to be answer one. Now, I always try to remind myself when I'm specifying this grading criterion here, I'm going to say absolute error equals to zero. And I have to now remind myself and go, ah, how was the answer? Was it in two decimal places, three, four? What was the answer in? Oh, right, I asked them for four decimal places. That's what this was rounded to. So I just want to go back up to my question now and clarify that to students and tell them specifically round to four sig digs. 
so that the student knows what type of answer they should be putting in. Go back down to the bottom now in my placeholder. I utilize a placeholder of number sign part one and I should have a really nice question. So I'll save those changes and I preview. Jim walked 16 meters at an angle of 258 degrees. What was the distance that Jim walked in the east-west direction round to four sig digs? We fill in the correct response and we can see our answer. That's perfect. So everything is working really, really, really well. Now, one potential problem with this is how do you want the student to respond? Well, right now, how this is basically working is if the student is walking west, then the student had to write a negative, a negative sign in front. That can be really confusing for students to think he's not really walking a negative direction. He's walking west, right? So we might want to clarify this with another part that says, some distance that they're walking and then have the student specify the direction thereafter. So they're not having to think about what positive or what negative is, etc. So let's build that in as well. So hopefully the student will always write a positive answer here, but then are going to be asked a subsequent question that essentially makes them specify whether that's to the east or whether that's to the west that, this, that Jim is walking in this question. Let's have a look at how we might do that. And so we go up to our variables here and we think about how we're going to do this. Well, essentially what we need is a conditional statement and the conditional statement needs to read that if my answer here is negative, then do this. However, if my answer is positive, then do this. So really I have two choices. The student either is going to have to respond with the answer east or respond with the answer west. So I'm going to construct a global variable that gives both of these choices to the student. My direction array is given by west comma east. So the student has to select either west or east. Now what the student selects as the correct answer is going to depend on the conditional logic and the answer that they write for 1a. So what I'm going to do now is define some conditional logic that selects the correct answer. So my direction, true, false, is given by the tyranny operator that says answer 1a less than 0. So I'm checking, is my, is my answer negative? If my answer is negative, then the zeroth item in the list is correct. So if the answer is negative, west is correct. Otherwise, east is correct. And there's my logic that I need in order to control this. Now what I don't want to have happen is I don't want the student to now write an answer that says negative four to the direction of west. Because what is that's actually east, right? I don't want to have to do that. And I don't want my answer to display to students as like negative four to the west or anything like that. I need my answer to be positive. So I'm going to utilize at this point a nice override to my answer 1a by redeclaring 1a but as an absolute value. So answer 1a is the absolute value of answer 1a. So what this is going to do is make the student write a positive answer for the magnitude and they're going to have to specify the direction right after. Okay, so that's that. Now let's go ahead and build this into our parts. So I'm going to change my answer here to be a two-part array. The first part of the array is still answer 1a, that magnitude. The second part, however, I need to become that distance or that value from my ternary operator. In other words, answer 1a, comma direction true false. So the student has to answer with a decimal place number and then has to select either the first item or the second item from that east-west list that we had built. So there we go, we've got that. Absolute error. Now under parts text, I'm gonna add some parts text to make this apparent to my student. So here I go. It's gonna be the first answer. I'm gonna provide an answer box for that first response. This is where the student will write their number, that first answer box. And then I'm gonna provide multiple choices of east or west 
given by this direction array. That was my comma separated list of east or west. And either the first or the second item from that array, the zeroth or the first item from that array is going to be the correct choice. So let's see what this looks like. We'll save those changes. We'll preview the question. And we can see now the student can respond to the, to the, to the question above in the, in the box and then can select either east or west accordingly below. We'll fill in the correct responses and we can see that things are working. Now one thing that's kind of awkward here is it might be better if the student just has an answer box and then directly beside the answer box is like a drop down menu that allows them to just select east or west. It's just a little more natural for the student to respond to the question in that way. A small change is going to let that happen. So answer box here and then right beside have this, this drop down response. So we'll close this and then open up part one. And I'm just going to add in the option here for this second response area in the part. And that option is going to be declared using a colon followed by MCE. What MCE is going to do is essentially take that response area and convert it from a simple multiple choice with bullets to a multiple choice with a drop down list. And that's going to work. Now, one other change I'd like to make to it, one of the power of using parts text is I can control how these response areas are going to align. Right now, I'll have an answer box for the student to type in the magnitude. And then below, I'll have a drop down box for them to specify east or west. I want those to be side by side answer boxes. So I'm just going to hit delete and make them appear side by side. So I have my numeric entry here for the magnitude and my drop down box here for the direction. Let's have a look. I'll preview and it's exactly what I want. The student answers the question here with the magnitude, the decimal place number, positive answer only, and they select the east-west direction there. We'll fill in the answers. We can see that it's working. And so this concludes our fourth video on global variables about the Moodle Formulas Question Type Series.